Good evening. I'm Brandi Burnwell, the Director of Alumni Relations at Ferris State University. And tonight I'm excited to share our November Alumni Social Hour, Snapping Shots, Photography That Is Picture Perfect. This evening, we will have the opportunity to learn some tips and tricks of photography. Whether you're a novice or a veteran, there will be something new to pick up on this crash course on online photography lesson and discussion. And what perfect timing as we enter the holiday season. For those of you hoping to capture those special memories with family or friends, or simply for those that want to one-up their Instagram game or other social media sites, tonight is for you. The discussion will be roughly 45 minutes. So grab your camera, your cell phone, or a pen and paper to jot down some notes. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions. At any time during the presentation, you may click the ask a question button near the bottom of your screen. Or if you're watching on Facebook Live, simply put your question in the comment section. We will take about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer questions. And now a little bit about our special guests this evening. Luke Wyckoff graduated from Ferris State University with a degree in marketing and sales in 1993. His career led him from working in print management to later becoming a senior account executive to founding his own consulting company, Wyckoff Consulting. Luke later formed Social Media Energy, a leading social media company establishing, maintaining, and evaluating the social media presence of major companies across the United States but it's his passion for photography that resurfaces time and time again. Luke has an amazing ability to tell a story in a single shot and cap captures images that are simply unforgettable. So with that, let's welcome Luke and begin our alumni social hour, Snapping Shots, Photography That Is Picture Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brandy. I appreciate it. You said social hour, but I didn't see your glass of Chardonnay. I was hoping to see your your glass, you know, ready to go. I'm, I'm hoping some other people may have their glass in their hand and they're ready to go. And thank you for having me uh, on tonight as uh, your speaker. Um, I love, obviously, to give back to Ferris State. Ferris State's where it all started for me. And when I have a chance to do something like this, it's it's exciting. And a little more exciting in the fact that I have never done this. So how about that? Someone who uh, picks up the camera and just knows what to do had never been asked to actually explain how I do what I do. And so when Brandy and the team came to me and said, hey, could you help people uh, think through as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving or we're getting ready for Christmas, how can we take a better photo, right? How can we capture that memory and make it Better. Or if you really do want to up your game for Instagram and your other social media sites, how would you go about doing that? She asked me if I would do that. And I said, absolutely. We'll figure it out. So tonight, with all of you, we're going to figure this out together. And for many of you who do know me, I, I really feed off of a crowd and an audience when I'm speaking. And so not having a crowd or an audience, just speaking to a camera is also a little bit weird for me. So if you see me kind of twitching a little bit, that's probably why. Um, she also had mentioned to put questions in the uh, private chat area or in the chat in the comments area so that we can see those. And I'll make sure I get to all those questions at the very end. So photography. Let's start off with, I'm going to start off with my story, basically of how I became a photographer. So growing up, I had a I had a dad who absolutely loved to take pictures. His love of pictures started when he was in the army and which is a perfect segue to thank all the veterans that could be on this call today for Veterans Day. Um, I posted a picture on my Facebook today of my dad and, uh, and when he was in Germany back in the early 60s, he picked up his first camera. That camera was this one and it looked just like that. So a great film camera, and he started taking pictures, lots of pictures with film. And I watched him growing up taking pictures, taking pictures, and then at age 14, I asked my mom and dad for my first camera, and they bought me my first camera, which was a Minolta X700. And that was a, that was a film, uh, that was also a film uh, camera. And I used that for a couple of years and I would shoot all sorts of things around uh, high school and other places. And then I got asked to shoot 
a calendar. Uh, the calendar was for the local Lions Club. So many of you might have Lions Clubs. Uh, they're a wonderful uh, organization. And uh, in the Lions Club in my in my big town of Sheridan, Michigan, so I'm, I, I would love it. I wish I could see a show of hands of how many people have been to Sheridan or know where Sheridan, Michigan is. They had a very strong Lions Club. And one of the things they wanted to do for a fundraiser was to put together a calendar. And that calendar was a parody of all the men who were in the Lions Clubs and it made a parody of what they did for a living. So if it was our local dentist, you know, it was it was something, you know, a, it would have been a picture of him with a big pair of pliers, right, with a person in, in the seat. Um, and, you know, from the from the local undertaker to the construction person, anybody who was part of that, it was my job to come up with something that was creative, that was a parody that would have fun, making fun of what they did for a living. And then they turned that into a calendar. And that calendar, then they printed, got ads and things, they printed, and that calendar they sold all over Montcalm County. And this was in 1987. That same year, the editor of the Greenville Daily News got a hold of that calendar. And she contacted the Lions Club and said, who took these pictures? And they said, this kid. And she's like, I wanna meet that kid. So I found myself sitting uh, in Greenville, Michigan at the Greenville Daily News, uh, sitting with uh, Sylvia Warner, who was probably one of my most amazing mentors I ever had in photography. We'll talk about her and some of my other mentors uh, in just a little bit. But she uh, ended up looking at my photos and said, hey, would you like to hang around with our photographer for a while and just see what it feels like to do some photojournalism? I'm 17 years old. I'm thinking, absolutely, this would be great. And so I started shooting uh, for the Daily News. And I and I and my first big assignment was Gus Macker. So I don't know. Have any of you ever played in the Gus Macker tournaments? That was probably one of my biggest ones. And it also showed me, um, remember, guys, this was back in film days, okay? Film, not digital. And in film days, you had to shoot, and you couldn't turn around and look right to go oh was that a good picture or not you had already had better gotten a great shot because you're only gonna have 36 pictures Ima imagine if those little digital cards that you had in your camera only held 36 pictures how many of those digital cards would you have to keep putting in every time you had to switch out a 36 uh 36 roll that's what we did in the film and i photographed the gus macker and then i started learning how to how to do um, all sorts of photography within the world of photojournalism. Now, photojournalism was very new to me and very different because I had never seen anything like that. And the person who taught me how to do a lot of that was all done in the dark room. And I had to learn how to develop film and then do the toughest thing ever. And that was take criticism and take coaching and mentoring from people who would look at your work and go, no, 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 that one. Okay, blow that one up, make it look like this, put this over here, crop it like this. Okay, that's our front page photo. That was very foreign to me to be able to, to be able to have to take that type of uh, like criticism on a regular basis. So I kept, kept shooting, I kept uh, working and then three months into working with the Greenville Daily News, the photographer who had mentored me the entire time, he ends up leaving and going over to the Muskegon Chronicle, leaving me the only photographer at age 18 at this point for a, a very large newspaper in the middle of Michigan. And I got to run the whole show for quite a few months before I left to become a freshman at Ferris. And that's how I dipped my toe in the water of photojournalism. Then what I did was I took my portfolio from Greenville, Michigan, and I walked it up to Big Rapids, Michigan, and I walked it right in to the Big Rapids Pioneer. And there I met with Jack Batdorf, who was the publisher at the time and the owner and uh, a wonderful human being. Um, 
I, had, I, I was out in Colorado when he passed a few years ago. I had heard that he had passed and, and I was, uh, I was sad. He was a very, very uh, excellent mentor. If I thought Sylvia Warner was tough, he was as tough, if not harder on me, uh, giving me feedback for photography. But I immediately stepped into a role and started shooting for Fair State and started shooting for the Big Rapids Pioneer. And I was doing everything. But when I say everything, this is where the story takes a little bit of a, a little bit of a twist. And that is what sells newspapers. If you guys went and turned down the newspaper tonight, If you went and turned on the newspaper, turned on the news tonight, what's the leading story? Is it a happy, feel-good story? Is that what's going to lead on the news tonight? If you picked up the newspaper tomorrow, anywhere, in any town, what's the leading story? Most likely, it's sadness and it's tragedy. Because in the newspaper business, they would say, if it bleeds, it leads. So 90% of what I did for the next five years as a photographer was cover some of the things that most people would never want to cover or never want to see in their lives. It was uh, the fun stuff, which was concerts, sports, all of those things only took up about 10%. And um, I never had that bounce, bounce it off of you thing that like a police officer or a, or a uh, EMT type of person can just, can just let it bounce off of them. That was never me. I kind of internalized it. And so after my sixth year at age 23, I actually put down the camera and said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore because all I was really photographing at that point in time was tragedy. Um, it was, I mean, every murder, suicide, fatal car accident. The last thing, one of the last things I remember photographing was a child drowning. And that was probably one of the worst things I ever, because as, as, uh, as they're as they're pulling the body out of the river, there's the mob standing there, and I am capturing the worst moment in this woman's life, and it's about ready to be told to the entire world. And that was it for me. I was done. I was out. So at age 23, I put away the camera. I said, I'm done. I went into corporate America, did my did my did my duty there, uh, started my companies, started to grow. Fast forward to age 46. Okay. Follow me here. I hope you're following. Age 23, put down the camera. Done. Never touching a camera again the rest of my life. Jump ahead. Age 46. I get asked to be the advisor to the executive MBA program for the University of Colorado. And part of that role and responsibility is to travel internationally with the students. And so I said to the, I said to the gentleman who was running the show, I said, well, where's our first trip? He said, we're going to start off in Berlin, Germany. We're going to end up in Cape Town. I said, Cape Town, we're going to South Africa. He said, yep, South Africa. I said, okay, South Africa. I said, we're going to South Africa? Are you kidding me? This is like, for, for someone who was a photographer or a past photographer, this was like one of those dream places. And I said, are we going to go on a safari? He's like, we've got two planned. I said, oh boy, oh boy. All right, if there was ever a moment where you had a, where you had a voice coming to you and said, it's time, to um to jump back in it was at that exact moment and so without the permission of the ceo who is the ceo of my social media company because by the way i did fire myself and hired someone better than me to run my company and she's like a thousand times better than me so without her permission i took the company credit card and went down to mike's camera off of broadway avenue in denver colorado and i bought all new Nikon equipment, because if I was going out at age 23 with the best stuff, I was going to come back in with the best stuff. And I have to tell you, it was literally like going from a cassette tape, right, to live streaming. I want you to imagine using a cassette tape in today's world. And that's what I know about photography is cassette tapes. Now you're in this entire, entirely different digital world. Everything's digital. All the all the editing is all done uh, virtually, and it can all be done in the cloud, which I'm going to do for you live at the very end tonight. I'm going to show you how I see a photo, right? That is exactly what I jumped into. And so then uh, basically five years ago, I jumped back in. 
And I had so much fun that I started um, uh, heading out to other countries and living in Jordan, Greece, Israel, South Africa, Vietnam, Japan, uh, China, Indonesia, and got to photograph all of the most beautiful parts of the world. And that's when I was starting to get picked up by National Geographic and uh, World Rugby and have got a chance to do some really, really neat things in sports, uh, working with the Denver Broncos and the Colorado Rockies. And so jumping back in was, was, a, was, was a thing of passion. And that was a, it was something that I always absolutely love to do. So that's where we kind of start tonight. So to get things rolling, I, to give you kind of a roadmap of what we're going to do, we're going to cover six quick areas tonight, six areas of photography. I'm going to give a couple of pro tips and then, a couple, and then an amateur tip. The amateur tip would be for the for those who uh, for those people who um, are are not who don't have professional cameras. Most of your photography is all done with your Android or your iPhone or your Google phone. We're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna run through all of those things for you, but I'm gonna cover six uh, topic areas tonight. And my goal always with any time I ever speak, especially in speaking with a group like this, is to have you walk away with at least one or two nuggets of knowledge that you did not know before we started tonight so that you can get it so that you can walk away and be able to take a better photo but that's a little bit about my background let's talk about the first part which would be landscapes now why did i start with landscapes it's funny that i would start with landscapes because actually landscapes are the thing that i hate to do the most um i'm i'm a huge landscape fan uh, ansel adams was always my was one of my favorite artists in this space I tried to emulate, I tried to copy, I tried to do things that were similar to what Ansel Adams uh, would have done. And then I just realized over time that it was never my, that was never my strength. Yet people um, seemed to like my landscapes. And so I had to go back and ask some of those people in preparation for this course tonight, what is it about the landscapes that kind of get you going? And what is it that you like? So the thing I learned from Ansel Adams, and you're going to hear this multiple times tonight, is the rule of thirds. So the, in the rule of thirds, if you take a look at the photo that we're looking at right now, these mountains, the mountains are the most important part of this photo. So they are in the upper third of the photo. Whatever is in the upper third of a photo, whether it is horizontal or vertical, is the most important part of the photo. Psychologically, that's where your mind tends to go first, and it's the first thing that you actually see. So when you are planning to do a landscape, when you're doing landscape photography, planning is the most critical and most important thing because timing-wise, the best time to shoot landscapes will always be in the early morning or it's going to be in the late evening. And here's something that you maybe did not know. You could set up your camera if you have a if you have a tripod or something that's going to hold your camera strong. You could set up your camera and start taking a picture long before the sun starts to come up, about 10 to 12 minutes before the sun actually starts to come up. There are just like the aurora borealis that comes over, you actually there are there are different types of lights that are coming through that are naked to the eye, but your camera will pick up on those. So actually some of the best photos you could take are just a couple of minutes right before the, right before the sun starts to come up. Consequently, the same thing at sunset, you'd wanna be, uh, be able to do that. Oh, I, I am loving some of these questions. Thank you. These are gonna be some good ones at the end. The best light uh, that I have always that I've always had is morning light. I've always uh, appreciated and, and loved morning lights. Let me tell you who hates morning lights: models. Um, any model who has ever uh, that I have worked with, um, they they hate the fact that they are up um, at three thirty in the morning to be ready for a, a four forty five call shoot uh, with the lighting team. Um, because morning light is, is, is my favorite. It's absolutely my favorite. And when you're taking landscapes, you're trying, you're trying to see a depth. You're trying to tell more of a story. Uh, this picture, as you can see from the bottom, this was taken, uh, right at sunset, uh, in Australia. That's the opera house on the left-hand side. 
and uh, left left side bottom. But what was neat was to be able to look at the different cloud formations that were happening. And, and sometimes, you know, you can try to plan out uh, a photo. Sometimes you can look at, you can look at a certain area and go, oh, this would be a great photo at sunset. Here's what happens. I love it when people say that, but I want them to go back and actually do it, right? I want them to actually go back at sunset and grab that photo because it probably would have been pretty awesome. If you thought it was great in the middle of the day, middle of the day is the worst time to shoot photos because of the harsh shadows and everything else. We'll talk about that a little bit. But when you're on, uh, when you're using iPhone, iPhones and other types of, um, other types of uh, camera phones, they tend to overexpose quite a bit. So a lot of those things are now cleaned up in the newer technology that, you, that you're allowed to do when you're editing photos. You can edit them and make a lot of changes to those. But I, I would say for, for the iPhone user, getting, getting a perspective, I'm, I'm a big fan of starting to use, if you have not used, take, take in, taking both of your thumbs, right? And, and, take, and go just wide, go like this so it widens you get a much more wider landscape. I love I love doing um, um, the big scapes, right? So you start all the way to your left, go all the way to your right, and be able to put together the big landscapes. That's one of my favorite features on the on these phones. Uh, that what they what they tried to mimic and mock on on the professional cameras was a fisheye lens, something that was going to be able to get all angles. And they've done a very, very nice job in the design of those. But the, the ability to go through and click through and look at those different landscapes are is, is, is that that is where if you can get the lighting key and plan out the photo, that's the most important part. My, my best planned uh, photo that I have done, well, there's two, and one's coming up here in a moment. The, the, the first one would have been... Um, and it's on the front cover of my travelprophotos.com website. And it's uh, it's the very, very front photo of a man in Bali. Uh, he was fishing. And I, and I saw him there. It was 10 o'clock in the morning when I went by and he was out there throwing out his nets. And I, and I asked him, I said, when do you usually get here? And he said, 3.30. So he starts to get there at 3.30 in the morning. So I show up at 4.30, a half hour before the sun's even coming up. I'm setting up the entire photo and, get, and, and getting ready for him to throw out his nets so I could have the absolute perfect photo of him throwing out the net. The one question I get asked when it comes to landscape photography is how do you do astrophotography? And that is, this is the, uh, this is the one that um, everyone wants to know about. Um, let me, uh, go back to the, if you can go back one, that would be great. Um, especially with the fall trees, if we would have had this, if we would have had this um, session a few weeks ago, as all this, as all the leaves were still on the trees, one of my favorite things is, is to have people just take their cameras and go from different angles. We'll be talking about different angles in just a few minutes, but taking your camera and shooting it, taking it straight up in the air. Uh, I have I have four or five pictures that were taken just like this. That picture was taken with an iPhone. That was not taken with my professional camera. Just to give just to give you an example of what that could look like. Astrophotography is um, not easy to do, and it becomes an art and a science. And that's what you're what you're the picture you're seeing right now is the moon rising over the mountains on the backside of Bailey, Colorado, and that is the Milky Way on the left hand side. Uh, that's uh, that, that's coming up. That's so prevalent now. To the naked eye, everybody, that is not what that photo looked like. That photo looks that photo looks completely dark and completely different when you actually take it. It's not until you get into the editing room that you realize what the what the camera actually saw compared to what your naked eye saw. So, how do you take an astro? Uh, picture like that where you can pop all of the where you can pop all the stars you take your camera and you put it on a tripod you open up the lens as wide as it could go 
which which uh, when you're opening up a lens on a pro lens, it's at 2.8 or 1.7. If it's a fast lens, slower lenses are about 5.6. And I, I promised Brandy I would not get into the technical details that I absolutely geek out about and love about photography. I promised her I'd keep it at a at a uh, into into a 10 foot uh, pool here, so that so that we can make sure everybody's on the same page. But you take your camera, you point it straight up at the at the stars, right? You open up your lens for 30 seconds, for 30 seconds at 2.8. And you can pull a picture like this if two things are happening. Number one, there is no light pollution. So for those of you who really want to geek out, there's actually apps on your phone that are light pollution apps. That will show you wherever you are, where is where is the least amount of light pollution. If you can, if you can look, if you can look across and 200 yards away, 300 yards away, you see um, a farmer's light on his on his barn. That is light pollution. You will not pull a photo like this, even with a even with a um, light that's 200 yards away. It has to be pure darkness. You point it up. You open it up for 30 seconds and you set your you set your uh, lens on infinity. So it has the ability to make sure everything that is possible that could be clear as far as focus, focus point is going to be clear. Now, that means I know for all of you electronic freaks who just love manual mode, this is not a manual mode photo. You will not take this photo in, or you, this is a manual mode photo. You will not take this in any other mode. You actually have to turn everything to manual, control everything. And that's how you pull a photo that's similar to that. So there's a couple of ideas for landscapes. Let's talk about animals. And you, why I love talking about animals is because all of you post your pictures of your animals on Instagram all the time. Why? I see all of your dogs, your parakeets, your cats, your exotic lizards, uh, everything that you have. Those things are all, um, all over Instagram and everything else. Photographing animals is by far probably one of my favorite and scariest things uh, that I've ever done in my life. Um, I started off uh, by just uh, helping out some friends, doing some horse racing and some horse jumping and equestrian types of shots is where I started. Um, if you really want to go back to the uh, to the Greenville Daily News days, it was all 4-H, all the 4-H stuff that was happening. A lot of animal shots that made the newspaper there. But it wasn't really until I got over to Africa and got to spend time um on safaris and then in private safaris where you are up close with animals and is it is one of the scariest and dangerous moments of my life um, i believe we added a photo here that comes with a story which probably is one of the scariest moments of my life and that would be this one that is a cape buffalo for those of you who have never seen a picture of a cape buffalo and i want you to see the smile that this Cape Buffalo has on its face. It's very happy that I'm there. It's very happy that I'm in its space. There's about 30 of him all around uh, standing there. And I was with um, another photographer. And you know what? Here's, here's a funny thing. When you guys look at African safaris on commercials, um, like they show them on commercials, they always show you in these, in these like Toyota Ford runners, right? and these escapades and stuff like that. When you're over in Africa, it is nothing like that, okay? I'm in the back of like a 1982 um, S10 is what I was in. The, the side of it was about ready to fall off, right? It's me and it's another photographer and our driver. Our driver had been um, a safari guide for over 30 years. We found this group of Cape Buffalo and he turns to both of us and says, you'll wanna get your pictures as fast as possible. Because this of all animals in the jungle is the one I fear the most. And I've been doing this 30 years. And I'm like, why? He's like, lions are lazy. They just are. You could walk by a lion. You could literally walk by a lion in the middle of the day and it would totally ignore you. 
four thirty in the afternoon, he's gonna eat you. But noon, the, 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 he'll just he'll just put put his head up and look at you, right? The Cape Buffalo is just angry that you're breathing. Okay, he's angry that you're alive and angry that you're even in his presence. And so, as this animal start just got done with its face in the mud, it turns to look at me. And I'm getting the photo and it starts making these noises. And the driver says, you guys need to sit down. And I'm like, but, but this is like the best photos ever. He's like, sit down right now. And we started to back up. And the entire herd started turning towards us and started walking towards us. Now, the Cape Buffalo doesn't just, doesn't just like kill you quickly. It plays around with you. So anybody who really wants to get on YouTube, go put Cape Buffalo versus anything inside of YouTube and you'll 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 be you'll be scared all night long watching what this animal does. We got our butts out of there so fast. But but being able to capture um capture an animal like this was really a special moment. What makes this picture so good and where you need to think about animal shots when you're shooting, when you're taking photographs of animals, look where the eyes are. Look at this picture and look where the eyes are. The eyes are one third the way down the down uh, the photo. Two thirds of the photo is sitting there. The eyes are always at one third, and that's that's how that's how you want to have um, your portrait work and your animals. All of those things always eyes one third the way down. You can kind of go ahead and click through these. One of the things that animals, um, the last thing on the animals, see, see the eyes one third the way down. The one thing I'll, the one thing I'll leave uh, for those of you who are the uh, iPhone users is portrait mode right now for putting your putting your camera in portrait mode for animal shots has by far been one of the best inventions that have ever been made as it blurs the background and brings the brings the animal to the front. Which is where you want, which is where you want that animal to be. We'll quickly go through food because some of you might be a little bit hungry, and we can't have any hangriness. But food, um, I didn't start uh, taking a lot of pictures of food until I had a brother-in-law who uh, became a chef. So um, he's uh, he owns a, a place in uh, Sparta, Michigan, called All in One Chef. And he's a phenomenal chef. And I started taking pictures of his food because it was so beautiful uh, to design and put out there. But if you take a look at a picture like the one you're looking at right now, this is a great example of depth of field. This is where we want the, the subject, the most beautiful part of the delicious part of this picture sits front and center and everything behind it is completely blurred. And that is that is one of the things I do a lot in my photography, and you'll see it in my sports coming up and portrait work, is I'm a big fan of blurring a lot of things behind me and bringing things uh, to the very front. But um, to give you an example of what that looks like just on your phone, so anyone who has their, uh, their phones with them right now, all of you, I know a lot of you take pictures of food and you put it on Instagram. I know this because I see it, all right? So... Here's how everybody takes a photo, right? They, they, they have their food in front of them. They go just like this. I bet all of you have done this, right? They go just like this and they go click. And that's what, that's what their food looks like, right? It's from the same exact angle. That's why everybody's food looks exactly the same. So for, for, your, for your viewing pleasure, this is what Schuberg's chili looked like at lunch today. When you, when you take that picture from that angle, that's what Schuberg's chili looks like, okay? But I'm going to challenge all of you as we go into Thanksgiving and you're looking at the beautiful desserts and you're looking at all of the, uh, the great turkey and everything that gets put out. I want you to take that camera and, you're, and this, as soon as you do this, you're going to say, Luke told me not to do this. Luke said, get low. Take that camera and get it as low as you can and start shooting across your food instead of on your food. Because this is what Schuberg's chili looks like when you get low. 
Got to do that just right. All right. So how appetizing is Schubert's chili looking now compared to just shooting straight down at it? So that's that's my that's my uh, that's my tip. My big tip for food is change your angle. Some food looks great shooting straight down on it. I mean, literally straight straight down. Some looks good in an angle, but the one thing that ruins food ruins food photos. Okay, is ambient light. Anytime you can shoot photos of food using natural light, it's always always going to be better. That's why you get such horrible photos when you try to use your flash is because, it, because it's leaving the harsh shadows. You want the, you want the ambient light that takes away all shadows and softens everything around you. And that's the best way to shoot food. Okay, let's switch on to the next topic. Portrait work, people, photographing people. Um, I love to photograph uh, people because this is, if when you can capture uh, someone's moment in time, this is where I have probably some of the most fun in photography. And all of you remembered a few moments ago when I told you what it was that took me out of photography when I was 23 years old and why I, why I stopped doing photography. It's moments like this that brought me back. I said, if I was going to come back with my camera, I was going to do something amazing. And so when I, when you're taking pictures of people getting their attention, getting the eyes, they don't always have to be looking directly at you to be able to capture the moment. You can click through a, a few of these. Ben, is Ben still there? Okay, so when when we're talking when we're talking about this, we also are using the rule of thirds, and so one third the way down is always the most important part of the of the of the photo itself, and that is where you want to focus a lot of your attention and your energy. Ben, if you're there, I need you to click through some of these photos, and. I am not seeing him. Oh, there he is. There's Ben. Okay. Again, when you're doing when you're doing photography, see where the eyes are. One third the way down. Next photo. One third the way down. Eyes are always at a eyes always sit right at one third the way down. That when you start, when you do that one thing that changes it for people photography, that's what make that's what makes all the difference in the world. Go ahead and click through. Let's talk about. Oh, she's with a bulldog. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta notice. You gotta love the bulldog. Family pictures are always done in triads. This is the the rule of triangles when it comes to family pictures. If you're taking family pictures around Thanksgiving. If there's, if there's three or more people, you're always putting someone in the front and someone on both sides behind. And if you can do a triangle on each of those, you're always, you're, you'll always, it'll always pull the eyes into exactly where it's pleasing to the eye. And, and people say, well, how do you take such a great family, how the family pictures are taken? It's not, it's not anything great that I am physically doing is that I am putting people, you can click through again. I am putting people in, in the right place so that they're always, it's always balanced. There's always complete balance uh, in every single photo. And the one thing that you always want to remember when you're photographing people, you only focus on the eyes. You focus on the eyes first, let everything else fall into play. If the eyes are perfect and in focus, everything else absolutely works. Go ahead and click through. Sports. Uh, that was from the Denver Broncos. Um, this was a uh, this was a practice at uh, at Mile High with the Chicago Bears. You can just click through a few of these because we're running short on time. There's a fair State photo for you. Um, there are there are a couple rules of photography when it comes to um, when it comes to sports. 
that you always want. And this is for all of you parents who are photographing and taking pictures of your kids in sports. What's the difference between a good photo and a great photo when it comes to sports? There are two things that every editor taught me that's critical. And I'm actually, in my last couple of moments here, I'm actually going to teach you and show you what I do. So I am actually going to go share screen here. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to take you live into Ferris State basketball versus Michigan State last week. And there's something that I quite commonly normally do. I'm showing you the actual raw files of my photography at, at the Breslin Center in East Lansing. And I'm showing these to you because this is how an editor goes through and looks. People go through and look. And people go through and go, oh, these are good. These are fun. Oh, look at that. That's that's a, Look at the emotion on his face. What's wrong with this photo? Where's the ball? We don't see the ball. And that's the problem. The two things that you have to have in every really good sports photo, you have to be able to see the player's eyes, at least one of them, and you have to see and you have to see the ball. The ball has to be in the picture. Here's a great example where it looks like it's a fun photo. You can kind of see the person's eyes, but half of the ball is missing. You got to have the full ball and you have to do this. You have to be able to get those in. So a picture like this is good, but in, but my editing coaches would tell you that in order to make a picture great, something that something that would that would be used uh, at a later time, you have to be able to edit that photo in a way that uh, that brings it in so that everybody can uh, see it looks like there is not enough band. There's not enough bandwidth in Big Rapids, Michigan, to be able to edit this photo live while I'm live with you. The point being here is that you want the most important part of this photo is the eyes right here. And those eyes in the final product have to be one third of the way down. One third of the way down because he is the most important part of that photo. These are little things you do, little things you learn about being in uh, in in uh, Big Rapids for part of the year. Let's see here. So um, that is that uh, when it comes to editing and shooting photos, especially with sports, uh, two fiftieth to five hundredth on for pro cameras, we'll be able to capture most of the uh, most of the speed and. And if you're going to uh, if you're going to be showing pictures or giving pictures to grandparents or other people, make sure that it's a picture of you can see whatever ball is in the photo and you can see the person's eyes. Those are the only type of um, pictures that, like a magazine, um, whatever print, if 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 you get a chance to see those. So, uh, with that, uh, at exactly here, seven forty three, I'll go in and jump into some of the questions. What's been my favorite photo or photo since coming back onto the scene? What has been my favorite photo? Um, uh, you're actually you're actually looking at it uh, over my shoulder um, right there. Um, I got to go over to India and spend time in Calcutta, and I lived with the lowest caste in, in India, as you know, is the caste system. And it goes from the ultra, ultra ultra wealthy all the way down to what they call the undesirables. And in the undesirables, they live in the slums. And in these slums, um, there could be three to four hundred thousand people um, in in one little slum area. And the one that I was in had one point two million people uh, in the slum that I the slum that I was in for ten days. It was one of the worst things I said. I'd, I'd said I would never go back. Um, it was 100 degrees. It was 100% humidity um, because of the Hindu culture. Um, when when cows um, when cows which are sacred when they when they fall over uh, they don't move them they just decompose and so it smells like it smells like uh, animal decomposing animals with 100% humidity. One of the worst places I've ever been in my life, and yet meeting that woman 
I'm looking, there we go, meeting her and uh, and her husband, who's right there. There we go. Um, meeting those two, I met two of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. They had nothing. And I, when I mean nothing, I mean, they they would have to walk, you know, three quarters of a mile to a mile every day just to get a bucket of clean water that they that they would use. They had nothing. And they were the happiest humans I think I've ever met in my entire life. And it just really puts things into perspective. And so that probably is one of one of the favorite people photos um, that I've ever taken in my life. Um, another question and feel free to put any other questions you have into the into the um, comment section. Um, for, for some of the newbies, you hear the term golden hour. What is the golden hour? Uh, that golden hour is, is, uh, we, we make fun of it cause it's not really an hour. Uh, it's actually more like a golden 20 minutes and it's, and I, I say, I say it's the, um, the 10 minutes before the sun has set and the 10 minutes right after the sun has set that 20 minutes, I guess could be called the golden hour. And that would be, that is the absolute best time that you have to, to take photos by far. Um, you said you edit for us in the end, but did you ever edit a photo on your phone or app or something? It seems like there are a thousand apps out there. There are, there are tons of apps out there. Um, the, the pro app, the pro app that I use on my phone that I use all the time is, um, Adobe and it is, uh, it's Adobe Lightroom is the name of it. It's, it's the black one that says the little LR right there, Lightroom. That's the one that I use uh, on a regular basis. That's uh, for more high-end professional uh, photography. I think you'll see as people get it better. I, I use Adobe uh, Lightroom also for my, for my editing purposes when I'm editing. That's uh, one, of the piece, one of the pieces that I, that I use on a regular basis. There are a thousand different photo apps out there. A lot of the apps are not so much editing, they're more manipulating. So um, I know that's one of the things that people have right now, um, issues with body image and things like that, because I can literally make anybody look amazing. And I see, I see the things that people post. I see the things that, and, and I know, and I know these people, right? And I'm like, wow, there was a, there's a lot of work done on that, on that photo, right? And so people do, they take, they take a lot of time to, to go through and, and, and make sure that the image is, is wonderful. Um, I do enjoy the people who do the after and the before and kind of show you what they actually look like, but I'm a big fan of Lightroom. Uh, that's the one that I use. Um, what software do I use to organize uh, photos and put everything together? I tend to use um, uh, Google. I'm a big fan of uh, Google Images. I put things into Google Images when I'm after I'm done uh, shooting an event. We'll, we'll say that I, I photograph the Red Wings, right? I get done with the Red Wings. I photograph the. Um, I, I I come back. I can edit the photos quickly, put them up in, and I can send that link to uh, the coach, who is a Ferris grad. Hope all of you know that. And that that link can then go out to all the players, and then all the players can use them in real time. Um. But that is that's the uh, that's the that's where that's the organization that uh, that I use um, on, on a pretty regular basis. What are some of the places on your bucket list that you'd love to take a photo? Oh, that's that without a doubt. Um, I didn't get to celebrate my fiftieth birthday. Uh, COVID hit uh, three weeks before my fiftieth birthday, and at that time, I had the opportunity to go to Antarctica with Rory Gielitz, who is uh, the number three guy at National Geographic. He's probably he's probably my mentor, someone who I would look up to. He's one of the best animal photographers I've ever seen in my life. And I was scheduled to head up to uh, Antarctica to be with him for 10 days. I know some of you are like, that's a vacation. I'm like, that'd be awesome. You know, with the polar bears and the seals and the, I mean, it would have been incredible. And so when COVID hit, everything got canceled. So uh, to celebrate my 50th birthday, of which uh, I'm, I'm more than a year and a half into that, I still haven't celebrated it yet. So Antarctica is still on the list. I'd love to go do the Amazon. Um, I've never been in the Amazon yet. That's that's on. And then as far as like architectural and just really cool history places, I've really got to get to the pyramids of Egypt and get to Machu Picchu down in Peru. Those are the places that those are the places that I really really need to go next. Um,
And that story about critiquing my work, you mentioned choosing one photo out of many. Is that something you still find happening as photography skill has grown? Have you been able to grab that perfect photo right off the bat? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because that is probably one of the funniest moments that I have um, in photography right now when I'm sidelines, at, like we'll say a Denver Broncos game, right? And I've got, we'll say this young buck that's sitting beside me. And if you haven't known, like back in the day in an NFL football game, if you went to a Lions game, okay, maybe there were three of us at a Lions game. No, there were like maybe four pro photographers back in the 80s, late 80s at a, at a, at a professional game. There's like 12 to 16 professional photographers at a pro football game today. And I'll, and I'll walk out, I'll walk out of a, um, of an event like that. And I will have taken maybe 400 to 500 photos for a four quarter game. And the person beside me took, took close to 6,500 photos, 6,500 pictures. That's the difference between someone who grew up in film and someone who is uh, the kind of prey and spray where they could take, they could take that camera and shoot at eight to 12 frames a second and just, just go and one of those pictures is going to be amazing. It just is. I'm more of the school, a little bit of old school where I can anticipate because you, when you photographed every type of sport, you learn those sports inside and out and I can anticipate what's coming so where, where one person would take, you know, 35 to 40 photos on a, on a segment, I will take like four or six pictures in that same, same segment. And I know, I just know off the bat, one or two of them are going to be good because, because it's, it's the way it, when you, that's just experience when you, when you, and when you have, when you have the chance to do that, when do you reckon, reckon, rec or when should you use a flash on your cell phone recommendations? Uh, flashes on cell phones have gotten a lot better. Um, um, you'll see flashes on cell phones, I think are more dramatic. Um, I, I always use them when it's really, really low light and you'll get a very, very big dramatic effect. Uh, some people still use them to pop. They'll, they'll pop, um, uh, they'll pop a photo so that there's no shadows on a person's face. Um, those, that's the times that I would use flash. But uh, my last recommendations, and then I'm going to wrap it up and end, and I'm going to pass it back over to Brandy here. My last recommendation is, you know, um, people people used to say, oh, God, it's a perfect day. It's a sunny day. Let's go out and do photography. You have to realize to a photographer, that's just pure hell. Sunny days? No. You give me a cloudy day. I call it God's natural diffuser, right? Because it softens everything up and there's no harsh shadows on the face. So you take a cloudy day is always better than a sunny day to get photos of people, especially of people, and watch how it softens up things like animals. And then the more you can use natural light, when you are doing photos here coming up at Thanksgiving, right? Let's take Thanksgiving, for example. I want you to always, when you're getting ready to take a picture, I want you to look around the room and look where the light is coming in from. It's the light, the natural light is coming in from some direction in that room. And you want to always put your back, okay, to the natural light. Let that natural light be behind you, come, going towards whatever it is you're taking a picture of. Because that's where all your pictures will make a huge difference. And you'll start getting rid of all the shadows, right? And all of those things, you're like, oh, that picture was really dark. It was really bad. Oh, it was the lighting. It doesn't have to be the lighting. Let the lighting work for you by always putting the natural light behind you facing towards the person that you're shooting. Hey, I just want to thank all of you. I hope that, like I said, at any time that I had a chance to speak and, and I feed so much off of a live audience and this is so weird for me to do this tonight. So it was really odd, but I had, I had fun. I hope you had fun. And I hope that like in any type of speech or any type of learning moment that I have with people that you were able to take one or two nuggets of knowledge out of this and be able to uh, jump in and hopefully uh, over the holidays really increase and take some better photos uh, with your pro camera or your cell phone camera. So thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Brandy, thank you. Thank you, Ferris State, for having me.
Thanks, Luke. Those photos, a lot of them are just so breathtaking. I know I was taking notes as you were going down. I'm excited for Thanksgiving now. We're going to respect that bird. We're going to get a bunch of good photos. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you for spending the hour with us. I think you were very helpful. Have a good evening. Excellent. Thank you. As a reminder, if you missed any part of the presentation or would like to go back and review a section, this webinar can be found beginning tomorrow on this website under past events or on your Facebook page at Ferris Alumni. And if you would like to join us next month for our Alumni Social Hour, then check out our registration page for the details on Rolling in the Dough Holiday Dessert Creations. Back by popular demand are Amy and Steve Dory. Many of you will remember last December when the Dorys took us through the art of charcuterie boards. So it only made sense to ask them to join us again during the holidays with some of their favorite desserts and holiday recipes. So mark your calendar now for Thursday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And for more information on their vir virtual presentation, you can find that on our website at ferris.u backslash alumni. Again, thanks, everybody. I hope you have a good evening. We'll see you next month.